I think it's fair to say within the next 10 to 15 years, that's the new realm of drug products that are going to be coming out for humanity. And it's pretty exciting stuff. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Paul Groffalo, CEO of Locust Biosciences. Welcome to Human OS Radio. Hi, Dan. How are you? It's great to be here today. Thank you for the invite. You are working on some of the most interesting stuff happening in science at the moment. Today, we're going to have a conversation around CRISPR and your company. You've recently raised a round from Artist Ventures and Tencent, and there was a few others in that Series A round. Abstract Ventures and the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. Right. Tell us a little more about CRISPR and the Cas3 system that you're working on. I guess the best place to start is what is CRISPR? Because I think most people commonly think about CRISPR today as a molecular pair of scissors that can be used to do gene editing in human cells. But actually, what the origins of CRISPR are is a bacteria cell's immune system. Okay. 50 plus percent of the bacterium in the world actually have an endogenous CRISPR system inside of them that defends the cell. Unlike a human body or a larger organism, bacteria cells have to survive by themselves. Mm -hmm. And they sort of come equipped with all the machinery that's needed to ensure their survival. And what LOCUS is all about is our scientific founders and the scientific team we've surrounded them with has essentially learned how to hijack that immune system and bacteria and turn it on itself. And so CRISPR-Cas3 is a novel platform, an existing system that's inside of most of the bacterial targets we're going after that can be tricked to kill itself. And so we're working on a large group of drug products that are hopefully going to replace broad spectrum antibiotics to be able to address the global threat of multi-drug resistance. Wow. We're pretty excited about the company and pretty excited about the technology. And I think that's what attracted really visionary investors like Stuart Peterson and the artist team, as well as David Wallerstein and the crew from Tencent. So couldn't be more pleased on that round and the partners we now have on the team. Let's go a little bit deeper into CRISPR. So CRISPR is an acronym, clustered regularly, interspace, short palindromic repeats. This is inside of bacteria as a way to, to basically provide protection against what? Well, a bacteria cell's got to do all kinds of things by itself that normally a larger organism would sort of work in consort with immune system or other biological tools to do things like defend itself from invading viruses or figure out how to potentially keep records of things that have attacked it in the future. Um, it can defend itself against those if they show back up again. And so what CRISPR basically is, that whole notion of the short repeat, it takes a snippet or a memory of every single invading phage or plasmid that comes into that bacteria cell to attempt to do something to it, normally kill it, and it remembers it. It takes a small snippet of its DNA, it adds it to a long list of other invaders that it's been able to ward off over time. And it essentially builds a memory or a vaccination card, if you will, that helps it to protect itself moving forward. And so CRISPR is the system that's evolved over millions of years in bacteria to help ensure that bacteria cells survive and evolve. Pretty crazy, sophisticated, natural system to be honest. And I think a lot of science is now honing in on that CRISPR set of functionality and really exploring a lot of ways of not just leveraging it inside of bacteria, but really porting that set of tools over to the human genome and trying to figure out how to do some pretty exciting things inside human cells as well. When was CRISPR discovered? I think most people would generally agree that CRISPR was discovered inside of a set of scientific labs of DuPont. And it was discovered 
in sort of 2005, 2006. And it was in Dr. Berengu's lab at DuPont that essentially the discovery was made that these repeats that they were seeing inside of bacteria genomes was actually self-defense mechanism. And they published a paper probably 2000, and don't quote me on the years, but I think it's 2007 that some of the original um, publications came out on CRISPR. And of course, what DuPont and others were really trying to do with the initial set of discoveries for a long time was to figure out how to harness that immune system to make food better, to ward off invading viruses that would attack bacteria, to help bacteria defend itself with even greater strength than the existing CRISPR systems. And so Mm. DuPont used it in things like yogurt and cheese to be able to do things like elongate the food spoilage process. Mm and worked with the technology for what was almost a decade before it popped out into a larger scientific purpose beyond, I would say, its bacterial origins. So we see that bacteria will add sequences based off of the virus that it's exposed to. And how does it use that system to defend itself against that virus going forward? So what CRISPR has the ability to do is to recruit different enzymes to be able to come and do different jobs. And they've been able to find that in some bacterial species, a particular set of CASs exists. And in some bacterial species, multiple CASs exist. And so probably the most well-known CAS is CAS9. And the way that Cas9 works in the CRISPR addressing capability uses essentially a location that's defined by a PAM to be able to identify a base pair location on a genome. And then it recruits the Cas9 enzyme, which that tool's function is to essentially behave like a pair of scissors. And it makes a clean cut across both strands of the DNA at the exact location that you identify. Mm. So that particular Cas is really used to repair a cell. It can go in and actually cut a DNA location and open up an area for some repair to that cell to happen. There are many different enzymes that not only have been discovered, but are likely yet to be discovered that are part of this CRISPR system. And the one that we've been able to leverage and harness is the one that's most prevalent in nature, which is Cas3. Mm -hmm. And the way that a Cas3 works is it uses that same addressing ability to go in and use a PAM to identify a base pair location. And then instead of making a double strand cut, it recruits what behaves like a Pac-Man. And it makes a small nick on one strand of the DNA, recruits that Pac-Man, and it unzips, unwinds, and permanently destroys one strand of DNA around the entire genome of a bacteria cell, effectively rendering the cell dead. And so we use the Cas3 mechanism of action to spearhead a brand new push in science around a new type of program, cell death. Ah. Excited about it. So the Cas is the enzyme that finds the right location in the genome, does the double-stranded DNA cut. In this case, the Cas3 acts like a Pac-Man to then chip away at the base pairs. And then in this case, it'll actually kill the cells. Yeah, that enzyme is really the tool. Yeah. You know, it might be a, a blunt-edged pair of scissors like a CPF1 that sort of cuts offsetting cuts. It could be a Cas9, which does a precise cut. It could be a Cas3, which uses a Pac-Man. And I think at this point, there's probably at least, I would say, five to seven fairly well-defined Cas's that folks know what they are and what they do. But I'm not sure anybody actually knows how many more Cas's are out there and what potentially the the tool could be used for. Mm. But it's pretty exciting, some of the activities that are happening in academia to figure out what all these different enzymes are that can be recruited and what they could potentially do, not just in bacteria, 
but actually what they might be able to do in cells that they get ported over to, or, you know, human cells are probably the most exciting thing yeah. that they're looking at. What are some of the more common applications with the CAS system? What's a range of utilities? So there are certainly efforts underway, not just to make modifications to genes in the human genome, but there's certainly a tremendous amount of work in the agriculture and food safety arenas to use that same functionality to enhance certain traits in crops, defend against bacterial infections in food, and to potentially even use different CRISPR systems to enhance some of the yields in pretty much any bioreacting process that might be out there industrially. Mm. And I think the favorite tool of most is certainly the Cas9. And I think that provides a, a great tool to be able to edit a target. But there's certainly other CASs out there to be able to do other types of functions. I guess the easiest way to think about it is CRISPR is seemingly a toolbox. Mm-hmm. And you might have a scalpel or a pair of scissors in there, but you probably also have a hammer and a screwdriver, and, you know, and maybe a Phillips head and other types of tools that may very well one day be able to do all kinds of fascinating things in human cells, plant cells, the soil, and, you know, undoubtedly anywhere that bacteria exists is a key target for the science to move. You also have application for modifying genes in living organisms. Is that correct? So in theory, absolutely. And I think there's a tremendous number of companies that are actually working on that. I think technically the way, and again, there's probably a lot more advanced PhD level discussion that can be had on this. But the interesting thing about the way Cas9 works is it makes a single cut across a strand of DNA. If you're trying to edit a genome and let's say take a gene or take a string of genes out, you need to make two cuts and you need to make sure that that little snippet that you've essentially tried to remove doesn't repair itself. And so the challenge on the technical side for human genome editing is, I mean, it's fantastic. And I think the promise of it is absolutely amazing. And the thing to keep in mind is that the Cas9 as a tool makes this very precise cut. But what you do after the cut to actually drive a repair or a deletion, repression, activation, those are the things that I think are really exciting. Mm -hmm. And I would say what a lot of teams are looking to do is to actually modify sections of the genome so that you can essentially do something like, let's say you're going after HIV. Mm -hmm. What you would be looking to do is to sort of make two cuts that are in the right locations to basically remove a string of genes that have embedded the HIV into the genome of the human cell. Mm. When you look at things like cystic fibrosis or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, I mean, the progress that these teams are making is phenomenal. Just super exciting (laughs) inventions are coming out that would allow you to look at those mutated cells and be able to potentially, if and, and this is a little bit out of my league in terms of what the company's focused on, but to be able to go in and catch it early enough that you would be able to modify those cells so that the body could essentially repair itself. I mean, that's just amazing stuff. I think it'll take a little longer to get those things approved. It'll take time to get that through the FDA, but I think it's fair to say within the next 10 to 15 years, that's the new realm of drug products that are going to be coming out for humanity. And it's pretty exciting stuff. I was reading about something very interesting this weekend. MIT researchers developed nanoparticles that deliver CRISPR genome editing system to modify genes in mice. What they were looking at is mutations in a a gene called PCSK9 that regulates cholesterol levels. So this is a gene that is associated with a rare disorder called dominant familial hypercholesterolemia. Right now, the FDA is looking at some antibody drugs that can inhibit that gene. 
but they have to take those antibodies for the rest of the patient's life. And with this new nanoparticle delivery of CRISPR, they were able to permanently edit the gene following a single treatment. And so instead of having to take these antibodies every single day or whatever the regimen is, but forever, you can just in one swoop edit it. And this thing that causes you to have too high levels of cholesterol, it's done. That's an example of the power of the system and why it's so interesting and cool. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the opportunity to be able to potentially be sitting on cures instead of treatments is really exciting. Yeah, I think the delivery of Cas9 into target cells and the repeated delivery that it'll take amount of exposures to the drug product to be able to permanently change the human genome and what the body is actually reproducing that's going to take more than likely a single shot and be done. Yeah. But we'll see with time. I think if you did a treatment for six months to a year and that was able to drive your cure, I think you'd be really, really happy with that outcome Yeah. rather than being on some kind of lifelong treatment to be able to address your disease state. No yeah. question about it. I also heard of a Chinese group that was knocking out the myostatin gene in beagles. Myostatin is a gene that inhibits muscle growth. So you can look at these Belgian blue bulls that have been genetically bred to have this enormous amount of muscle with a myostatin gene missing, and muscles just keep growing. And they look like they're about to win Mr. Olympia. They're <laughs> so buff. And so they were able to successfully modify it. And I did now hear of a human trying to modify myostatin in himself. And so what are your thoughts around the ethics involved in CRISPR technologies and how is that going to play out? Yeah, I think maybe my perspective is skewed by being in the field, but my sense of what technology has done for humanity through the course of time is that it's helped to drive the process of evolution and say that various technological advancements over the millennia have not had a direct impact on the evolution of the human body is probably putting your head in the sand and hoping that time will pass you by. And so I look forward to the day when we're able to actually do things along the lines of edit the human body in early stages of life before the onset of genetic disease takes effect. Mm -hmm. And from the perspective of being able to save lives and or meaningfully change lives, all of those pieces I'm 100% bought into. Yeah. And I'm sure they represent some challenges that need to be overcome. Delivery is probably one of the largest challenges to make sure that we deliver correctly to the right targeted cells and that that delivery is effective consistently. You know, that's what I would say a lion's share of companies are focused on and we're no different. Delivery is certainly something that needs to be commanded, and we need to make sure that that's right. But you get into this next level question with modifying the human genome, which is an ethical question about should the human body be enhanced in order to change the future of humanity? And that subject requires more discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think that most people would agree that wholesale editing of the human body to, let's say, let's pick one that is likely highly controversial. Let's say you wanted to make super soldiers mm -hmm. and you wanted to create a new group of human beings that were essentially genetically programmed to fight. That's many decades away to know which genes you would need to suppress and which genes you would need to activate in order to finely tune that type of outcome. But I'm not sure I would be supportive of that type of experimentation on actual human beings. And I think the thing to keep in mind, though, is that not surprisingly, there are many different regions of the world that are not going to agree with that. Yeah. And so you're going to have to get into human genome editing competition. And there is an argument to be made that you'll want to be in the front of that and not in the back. What I fear more is 
access. If you have the right amount of resources, you can make your children smarter, stronger, taller. You could accelerate the cavern between the haves and the have-nots that way. And that's something that needs to be constantly a part of the conversation. And I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, it undoubtedly it will be for the few and not the many at the initial steps. And how is that governed, if governed? Maybe the thing that I think is something to make sure you remember is these are not U.S.-based decisions. And you might look to the FDA to put their thumb down on being able to control the discussion and the debate. But it's a global technology. And frankly, just about every middle school and high school science student these days has access to CRISPR kits for their biology classes. And then this technology is available in every nook and cranny of the planet. And there are going to be a lot more people than just civilized cultures that are working on some of these things. And, you know, I think, honestly, that's going to have to be part of the discussion as well. I think the other thing, though, that balances some of that discussion is the practical reality of the difficulty involved in doing some of this. Mm. And knowing exactly what genes to manipulate, that's still needs a tremendous amount of work, although certainly there in certain fields of study. But the ability to deliver it to that location and get the exact outcome that you're looking at, that is very difficult science. And it'll take a good amount of time to get there, which should hopefully provide the right amount of time to be able to have those moral and ethical discussions. And I think those need to happen on a global scale so that we get alignment on an international level to be able to determine which way do you take some of these powerful technologies. The CRISPR train has certainly left the station and science all around the world is now picking up that technology and running with it. And it's not stoppable. The next sets of scientific breakthroughs in biological realm are very likely to come from CRISPR technologies. These are some very interesting and more controversial subjects, but you're not focusing on editing the human genome. You're focusing on modifying antibiotic resistant bacteria that we now a part of our world as well. Give us an example of one condition that is scary in terms of the degree to which it is resistant to antibiotics and how the CRISPR-Cas3 system platform that you're working on could help to protect us. There's probably a couple examples. I could maybe give you two to set the scale of it. Let me start with maybe an easier one that folks would be more familiar with. So you know Hugh Hefner, I presume. You know that he recently passed away. He actually passed away from a antibiotic-resistant strain of E. coli Hmm. that he contracted while he was in the hospital for other ailments. And it was that multi-drug resistant strain of E. coli that unfortunately was the final straw for Hugh. The reality is there's a number of bacterial strains, pathogens that are out there that are now developing pretty massive resistance to standard antibiotics and not just the standard ones, but the ones that are the more potent, higher tox profile drugs that are called last line of defense drugs. Mm -hmm. And so another really common, very familiar pathogen that's a pretty massive threat is MRSA or multi-drug resistant strains of staph. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that really have unfortunate breakout opportunities. And on staph, there's actually quite a few drugs that are being worked on for MRSA and BRSA infections. Maybe I'll start with some of the easier ones, but C. diff or Clostridium difficile, which is a pretty violent pathogen that you can get in your gut. If it's treated with a front line, you're in pretty good shape. But for the 25% of patients that actually that front line or standard of care has no effect on, you get into trouble pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And of that group of 25% that moves into secondary, you end up facing a pretty long battle to try to get rid of that pathogenic threat. And the end of that line is, is death. And the fair percentage 
of those that get recurrent C. diff actually do pass away. Mm. Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, even Klebsiella, Shigella, all of these bacteria that the CDC would list as essentially very high-profile risks and or threats. Mm -hmm. Those pathogens initially have very low MDR rates, maybe in the 5 to 7 percent, and then over the course of 10 to 15 years, or at least the last 10 to 15 years, many of those are starting to creep up into the 20s, um, some of them even getting further up into the 30s. What's an MDR rate? A multi-drug resistant rate. So of the number of infections that might be tracked, that percent which do not react to multiple antibiotics are considered MDR. So if you try two or three different antibiotics and you can't get rid of your bacteria or your infection, you've got a problem. And that would be considered an MDR strain of that bacteria that you're infected with. And you can get infections in pretty much any site of the body. Mm -hmm. Your gut, the lungs, your mouth, your skin, your throat, sinus cavities. I mean, all the common places where you would get bacterial infections and common bacterial infections that are now starting to be multi-drug resistant threats. These are big risks to humanity. And I think the one that maybe hits home for most is if a common staph strain can't be fought off by antibiotics, you can't have operating procedures anymore. You can't use a scalpel and cut open the human body to try to fix something else that's wrong because Mm. you would essentially get a staph infection from the operation right in the hospital. Mm. That's the one that has, I think, most government entities that just that reality. And that might not be staph. That might be pseudomonas or that might be, unfortunately, something called Cree or or carbapenem resistant enteriobacteriaceae. Cree is I think the scientific name for something that most probably know is what's called a hospital superbug. Mm -hmm. And when Cree strains break out, they tend to be 50 plus percent resistant to even last line of defense antibiotics like colistin. And you're in serious, serious trouble if you're up against a Cree infection. And so I think with time, expect to see these MDR rates rise. And that has most folks in the medical community concerned that novel discoveries to combat these pathogenic threats are not keeping pace with the advent of these infections. I'll tell you another one that's really scary, Dan, is gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. Gonorrhea has gotten up to be about 70 or 80 percent resistant at this stage. And that's been a pretty exponential hike years ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you could get a shot of penicillin and knock that out routinely anywhere in the world. Mm. Now, if you get a gonorrhea infection, those first line treatments that you come up against are only about 20%, 30% effective. And that's over the course of maybe like a 10 to 15 year period. Those are pretty scary numbers. Very these multi-drug resistant bacteria, they're getting more virulent, more resistant. And the solution is probably not creating more antibiotics, but probably something that is outside of the box. And that's what you guys are doing. Instead of trying to focus on using CRISPR to modify the genes within animals, you're looking at modifying the genes within bacteria to kill them. These multi-drug resistant strains, all those essentially can have isolates that are taken or, you know, think of getting a cotton swab in your mouth to be able to essentially um, identify that bacteria. Well, Once you have all of those isolates back, you can actually sequence them and you can look for conserved genes, genes that are common amongst a number of different strains. And what our technology has the ability to do is to take those conserved genes and actually build RNA guides that when they're injected into the target cells, if they find those conserved genes present, they'll recruit a Cas3 Pac-Man and essentially trigger program cell death or suicide in that cell. And so what our technology essentially does is for those infections that get past the first line of defense antibiotics, when you get a secondary or tertiary infection, 
and they've maybe tried one or two antibiotics and they don't work, you can use our drug product to go in and very specifically remove that pathogenic threat from the human body. And we can essentially program it to go after those MDR strains. And there are companies that are working on viral solutions with CRISPR systems. In fact, Stuart and his team at Artis have invested in a Cas9 play excision to actually go after just that, although they're attacking HIV as a first indication. So super exciting stuff. But so we do exactly how you describe that. We would do that to go after, let's say, staph or Clostridium difficile or C. diff or pseudomonas, which is the advancement of, let's say, pneumonia in the lungs. Those types of infections in the human body, you may take a pill one day to be able to go in to remove that pathogen from your stomach. Mm -hmm. You may inhale it from a standard inhaler like you might take if you had any type of, let's say, asthma. You might spray it on if you got the infection on your skin or if maybe you had an operating incision site that you were working on. And we hope to one day soon also have an, an IV drip so that you could have an IV bag that you could go straight into the bloodstream and circulate throughout the body. So what we like to do is pair what's called the route of administration with the site of infection. Mm. And so if you have it in your gut or your lungs or your mouth, the trick is to get the drug product to the infected cells so that you can inject your CRISPR commands and recruit the enzymes inside the targets or put the enzymes into the target and activate the tools to do the killing. Will these ever be like a vaccine? If there are certain bacterial infections that many harbor, can you give a CRISPR pill to then address multiple potential bacterial infections that are in the body? So you would logically think that you could give something that's considered a prophylactic. And we actually have some animal tests coming up to see whether a prophylactic approach would work more effectively, the same effectiveness and or less effectively as one of the treatment regimes. And we hope to, by probably the middle of 2018, have a really strong sense of whether or not you could do that. In theory, you would, because CRISPR is essentially a vaccination card, if you could somehow embed the right vent into that vaccination card, you could protect that potential cell moving forward. Unfortunately, that's the cell we're trying to get rid of. Right. And so I think for our technology, however, there's a possibility that you could do something like that. But Maybe I'll step back real quick and do just at least an intro to biology from maybe a basic level, since that's certainly in my forte, the basic description of biology. Please. You have two types of cells that are inside the human body. You have human cells and you have bacteria cells. That's essentially what's sitting inside of the human body. And each of those cell types has a natural predator. For human cells, you have viruses. And for bacteria cells, you have something that's called a bacteriophage, which is essentially a bacterial virus. But the two of them have evolved together to try to keep balance. So if you get hepatitis C or HIV or one of those viruses, the really nasty ones, what they're trying to do is they're trying to inject themselves and their commands into human cells and wreak havoc, which they do. On the bacteria side, you have these bacteriophages, or some people like to call them phages, but you have a bacteriophage, which is a virus, and it does the same thing. It attacks a specific type of bacteria, and it injects usually copies of itself with commands to replicate inside that host. And so you have this natural growth of the bacteria and this natural growth of the bacteriophage that sort of try to outcompete each other and bring bacterial infection back into balance. And mm. what we're doing is we're actually hijacking those phage and putting our CRISPR RNA guides and the actual Cas3 enzyme into those bacteriophage, sending those into the human body, using that as our delivery mechanism, 
and then injecting the CRISPR systems into the target cells. And so your ability to stick to either the bacteria side or the human cell side is pretty strong. I think most scientists, if not all, would agree that phage inject their payloads to bacteria and cannot inject them into human cells. Mm -hmm. And I think the reverse is true. I think that a virus is unable to inject its payload into a bacteria cell. And I mean, there's some exceptions to this rule with intracellular pathogens, but for the most part, that law of nature stands. Mm -hmm. And this sort of gets into where we think is Cas3's benefit to medicine. The fact that our CRISPR systems cannot and do not infect human cells inherently takes us away from that ethical and moral discussion. So we can't, with Cas3, modify the human genome. We can only affect bacteria cells that are in the body. So we don't have to get into any of that moral or ethical debate to figure out whether our science should be used. Yeah. Moreover, because phage only inject into bacteria cell and we can't edit the human genome, the chances of our Pac-Man getting into a human cell and wreaking havoc on the human body is zero because we can't deliver it to the cell. And even if you could, there's other reasons why it wouldn't work. Mm. But that inherently means that the only thing you're going to remove from the human body is bacteria. And we didn't get into on-target and off-target pieces yet, but I'm sure that's coming. But the nice thing about us as a comparator is that our comparator is, is essentially a, a broad-spectrum carpet-bombing antibiotic that indiscriminately kills good and bad bacteria throughout your body. Mm -hmm. And so our technology has the ability to go in and precisely identify and remove bacterial targets mm. without any risk at all to going into the human cell. Mm. And so it's a safe place for us to begin to advance CRISPR technologies because it's maybe uh, an easier technical challenge than what Cas9 teams are faced with in addressing human gene editing. So the Cas3 system would be able to edit mitochondria within cells? We do have some discovery efforts that are underway to try to figure out whether it's possible. And there have been others that have tried to figure it out. But the protein structure that needs to be embedded into the eukaryotic target or the human cell target mm -hmm. is very large. And so you have questions of how to deliver it and how to get it to express itself inside of a human genome or human cell. And you have the challenge of getting the mechanism to actually recruit the enzyme and do the right job. One of the most wonderful advancements on the human cell side was when Jennifer and Emmanuel made the single god Cas9 because it created this fairly small single protein structure that more easily could be injected into a human cell to do its job. Mm -hmm. On the Cas3 side, Cas3 goes along with a protein chain called Cascade, which actually can be anywhere from four to six proteins that you would need to string together. And the delivery of that into a human cell is, it may not be impossible, but it's virtually impossible. And I think that there's some benefits there. I see those benefits. And I'm also hopeful that you'll be able to solve that because removing mutant DNA from mitochondria has been shown to reverse or slow aging. This is some work from Caltech by Bruce Hay. That ability to remove mutant DNA from mitochondria as we age could keep our mitochondria that do exist younger. There's less clutter that builds up within the mitochondria, and they've been able to genetically manipulate the mitochondria, and they're able to preserve youth in animals that were aging. So this sort of an application, combining CRISPR and having the right targets, could be youth-preserving within our lifetime, which blows my mind. Also, the real comparator here is the carpet bomb that kills all the bacteria. And we know we have symbiotic bacteria that not only are neutral in their effects in the human body, but are also symbiotic. For example, the bacteria in the microbiome will synthesize vitamins, they will extract calories and produce short-chain fatty acids, and they do all sorts of things that affect our hormones. Have you thought of any application that would directly affect the microbiota specifically? Well, I think the 
C. diff drug product that we have is one that we think is a pure play microbiome approach. So in reality, C. diff is a little different than some of the other pathogenic threats that are out there because C. diff as a bacterial species is not necessarily developing resistance to an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. The issue with C. diff is that at least it's commonly believed by academia and science at large that when you use vancomycin to treat C. diff, you indiscriminately kill the good bacteria that are in the lower intestines that actually keep the existing C. diff cells in check. And so when you're doing this sort of indiscriminate carpet bombing of your gut, you're taking out the very bacteria that plays a very healthy balancing role inside of your body. And so one of the reasons why we love C. diff as an indication, even though the space can be considered to be a bit crowded, is we're the only mechanism of action that reaches into the human body and selectively removes just the bacteria that we're after, leaving the rest of the microbiome untouched. And so we're pretty excited to be able to prove out that Cas3 mechanism of action in the C. diff indication because it'll prove exactly that, that the capability of this CRISPR system is to go into the body in any location and be able to pull out bacteria that you've programmed it to remove. That's incredibly exciting. The simplification of our intestinal colony of bacteria is one of the reasons why pathogenic bacteria like C. diff can get more of a foothold and grow. And carpet bombing them, it's like a short-term solution, but sets the stage for a worsening of that situation in rapid order. Exactly. Yeah, and there's other ailments too. The really exciting part about Locus as a company isn't necessarily just the pathogenic threats that we're working on right now, but the medium range opportunities to be there as science begins to fully understand what good bacteria and bad bacteria are inside the body and what they're doing. And so you've seen, and probably with the show that you run, Dan, you've probably heard of various bacterial theories of things that are related to central nervous system disorders or diabetes and obesity or Mm -hmm. things like colorectal cancer and long-term exposure to the bacteria that sits in nitrates that sit inside of processed meats. And I think we firmly believe that all of those things are real. We firmly believe that there are good agents and bad agents that the body is exposed to environmentally and that the manipulation of those good and bad agents is something that could change the future of science. And the one bad part, or maybe the second very bad part, of the discovery of antibiotics is the lack of academic research that occurred over the last hundred years in in bacteria. When you don't have to worry about a bacterial infection because you have 26 different antibiotics that could be used to attack it, you don't study it. So people don't fully appreciate or understand what the long-term exposure or even short-term exposure to certain bacteria does to the body for things like dementia or cancer in the gut. I think most people would probably logically agree that there's certain foods out there that are probably causing some inflammation in your gut Mm -hmm. and that that long-term exposure to inflammation is probably doing some bad things. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we could take those bacteria out of your gut? Mm -hmm. What, What could we do? And what's the link between bacteria and the human body and the brain? There's got to be some link. Yeah. What is that link? And what happens when science catches up and is able to say, hey, this group of bacteria is causing this issue? Well, now we'll have a technology platform that can go in and take that bacteria out of the body. And that's the really exciting part about where we are. We're sort of right on the cusp of the wave, Dan. And if we're able to get the FDA through working with pathogenic threats to approve the Cas3 mechanism of action, hopefully by the time that approval comes through, science is beginning to catch up with other opportunities that we might be able to approach. 
over the course of this conversation, I'm having an increasing appreciation of what will become a necessity, which is the co-evolution of CRISPR technologies with an understanding of the omics of a microbiome. If you understand what bacteria are producing, the good effects, vitamin synthesis and suppression of inflammation, short-chain fatty acid production versus the ones that are more pathogenic, we're going to have some sort of interesting relationship where we have technology that can help us understand what's going on inside our body. We have precision medicine and we end up putting ourselves in a better situation to thrive. Yeah, and I guess, you know, to go down that road, if you put yourself out 50 years from today, do chemicals sit at the cornerstone of medicine or do proteins? Does the DNA editing and capabilities that are beginning to be born today eradicate the use of chemicals in medicine? Is it possible to do to chemicals in medicine what green technologies are going to do to oil? It's possible, Dan. It's possible that precision medicines that are nanomachines that are able to reach into the human body and change cells at a DNA level, that certainly 100 years, that is how medicine's going to work. Yeah. And we'll probably look back at this era in time and think about why did we put those chemicals into our body when we really didn't understand what they were doing? The future holds a lot more precision than what we currently have to deal with today. And in fairness, I think it won't just be humans that that's a true statement for. And as we start to look at the application of CRISPR outside of human medicine, I think that's certainly an area where we'll really start to see some very disruptive change in a number of industries where biotechnology sits at the center of them. And you were at the forefront of that movement, Paul, with Locus bio. So you just raised 19 million, as we talked about earlier in your series A. And what are you looking to do with those funds in the coming months to years? So the primary use of those funds is to advance CAS3 into human trials. Mm -hmm. And we have two, possibly three opportunities in front of us where we believe that we'll be able to prove the CAS3 mechanism of action can reach into the human body and selectively remove a pathogenic threat at will. And so that the 19 million is earmarked to be able to complete the needed preclinical studies to gain FDA approval and to be able to execute that human trial that's the efficacy human trial to be able to prove the CAS3 mechanism of action. Pretty exciting times ahead. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Your explanation of CRISPR, its potential applications, the futurist perspective of where this all might be in 50 to 100 years from now. It is fun to talk about how technology might completely change our world's stretches of time in the distance. But what I'm hearing is that in pretty short order, we might be benefiting from at least early versions of CRISPR therapies. Thank you for your work and thank you for your time today. We really appreciate you coming on to the show. Dan, thank you for having us. We appreciate sharing the story. Thanks for listening and come visit us soon at humanos.me.